Hey folks, Steve here with a new video series for you today. We will be taking a look at and playing through Case Yellow 1940, the German Blitzkrieg in the West, a game designed by Mr. Ted Racer. Now, this is a game from GMT, was published in 2011, and in my opinion, um, this is really, it's all about the framing. Uh, I believe that this should be considered part of the Dark series. Now, if you're watching this video and for some reason don't know what the Dark series is, it is a Hex Encounter series of games uh, designed by Ted Racer uh, involving chit pool, uh, meaning that the actions of the given factions, their sort of what they can do for a given action round is determined by a random chit draw. So you could have a faction move and then the next chit be the other side moves and you don't even have combats. Now there's always some level of you know nuanced rules where maybe you can do a few combats. It is a whole lot of fun. The series really hit its uh, debut officially with a game called The Dark Valley. Uh, that is a game that is pretty well regarded and it did get a deluxe edition a few years ago. Um, and I spent, gosh, that must have been really my first major game project on this channel, was playing through the entirety of The Dark Valley or at least as much as I could uh, go through in sets. I think I tried to do the full campaign, but we had to do some uh, restarts and changes and different things along the way. But I basically played through the entirety of the Dark Valley full campaign, and that was a pretty big deal. Now, since then, because of the popularity of the Dark Valley, uh, you had a game called The Dark Sands come out, which covers uh, North Africa. You also had uh, The Deadly Woods, which was actually published by a different company, covering uh, the Battle of the Bulge. And then more recently, you had the Dark Summer, Normandy 1944, from GMT. And whether you consider it the Dark series or the Dark and Deadly series, uh, each of these games is actually quite good. I've actually really enjoyed each game in the series, and I've basically looked at it saying, hey, as long as Ted keeps designing them, I'll keep getting them because they work great for Solitaire, which, you know, these days I play a lot of Solitaire as well, as I suspect many people do, for a great many reasons. And so... Uh, at once upon a time, a couple of years ago, I uh, found on the secondhand market a copy of Case Yellow 1940, and I had heard that it was quite similar. Now, um, you can see I have it set up here. It is the sort of, uh, it is Case Yellow, um, and uh, actually a little bit of Case Red too, uh, but just the beginnings of, or depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, but, but principally, yes, it is the German invasion or offensives mid the low countries and France. And while it does have its own peculiarities, its own rules, certain features that don't show up in other Dark Series games, it does have uh, the chip pool and a lot of the same sort of design mechanics um, actually are in other uh, games in the Dark Series. So it's sort of the proto Dark Series game, the game that came out before the Dark Valley um, obviously, the Dark Valley did its own thing to a great, great degree, uh, but this game feels very similar in terms of scope as the Dark Summer, uh, as the Dark Sands, in that you're looking at a 10-turn game, so shorter, not the, you know, 40-some turn Dark Valley game, um, and really a, a very specific scope uh, of the game here, as opposed to the entire East Front, um, or even, you know, like the Dark Sands covered North Africa, this is very much in line with the Dark Summer and the Deadly Woods being very specific uh, operational campaigns uh, that can be completed. And so since it's publishing in 2011, which is two years prior to the Dark Valley, um, this game's not gotten a lot of, uh, I guess, coverage or a lot of fanfare, I suspect, because, you know, it, it again, it predates the Dark Valley. Um, it is a campaign where, you know, the Germans are known to have, you know, won decisively. And so you might ask, well, what's the fun in the war game of that? Well, there, there are plenty of other games that cover this kind of thing. In fact, you know, there's an OCS one called Blitzkrieg Legend, which has a lot of proponents. So my intention with this series is to run it through its paces um, and, and see how it plays. Now, uh, because I'm playing Solitaire, I don't mind it being... Um, perhaps seen as one-sided, uh, I will say that the game allows you to do more than just the historical scenario. So um, let's talk really quickly about what's in the game. You obviously have uh, the map, 
you have the counters, no big deal there. Uh, you do have a uh, rule book and you have a, a playbook. Now the rule book comes in at, you know, really 22 some 23 pages of rules, which is pretty light, all things considered. Uh, and the playbook has, you know, your usual different sets of things included. The, uh, the table of contents actually on the inside flap. You can see there's a scenario one, which is the historical campaign. You can actually see there's even a few extra rule sections that made it over to the playbook. Uh, but there's a historical campaign, and you're going to notice that there are a lot of extra rules for each scenario. And that's one thing I kind of dislike about the format of this game is that, yeah, you can read the basic rules, but before you can even play a campaign, you have to look at which campaign you're going to play, and then you're going to read another, you know what, another almost 10 pages, well, okay, five or six pages of rules. I don't like that, but uh, you can see there's a historical campaign, which is going to give you the historical narrative the allies are going to have some rules that make them play a little dumb and have some movement requirements and this is probably the scenario that works best as the solitaire game because okay i will do what i can as the allies given the play silly rules or you know follow the dial plan um but you know then i'll be playing the germans and they can do their very level best here in scenario two you can see better allied intelligence so this takes off some of the dumb allied rules and the allies have a little bit uh, greater leeway and then you have a scenario three what if scenario which really balances things out quite a bit uh, and then you have scenario four which is actually a mini scenario which just covers uh, the netherlands and there's actually a, a side map that you can use instead of the full map and i'll be careful to point out that no matter which scenario you're playing doesn't matter if you're playing the sort of like balanced sides or the historical, the victory conditions are more or less adjusted for that. So what it does is it just changes the tempo of the game, I think. So in the, the historical game, ultimately what we're going to be dealing with is, yes, the allies are going to get pushed back and defeated, um, and it's going to be about how much can we slow down the Germans, how many units can we get out via Operation Dynamo, and all of that, so we know, like, yes, we're going to get pushed back, but it's all around where the Germans get to in the time that the game uh, allots. If we were playing Scenario 3, um, the victory conditions would be, again, balanced such that, you know, if the Allies are going to do a better job, great, but still, if the Germans do pretty good, uh, they could still win that scenario. Um, so don't think, you know, if you were looking to play this as an opposed game, there's zero value, there's probably some value there. You just have to pick which scenario and acknowledge are you going to play with, you know, the the historical railroading issues that the Allies have had, or uh, yeah, are you going to play without that, or are you going to play with that and do the historical? Again, because I'm just playing myself, I, I'm going to have this be the historical scenario, because uh, I just want to see how well the game handles uh, the historical narrative and the way that things sort of panned out historically knowing that I may make some moves that are not exact history, and, and we'll just go through the motions and see how it goes. Um, because it's a 10-turn game, I don't expect this to be a very long series, uh, but it will be sizable probably on the same level as The Deadly Woods if you watched all of those videos. I do have a dedicated playlist for the Dark and Deadly series, so if you're interested in seeing any other games in the series in a great detail, I have videos covering a lot of my play reports as well as reviews, so all of that is available to you to check out and if you're going to stick around for the whole gameplay series, I uh, really appreciate that. Hope you enjoy. Um, I'm sure folks will catch some rules mistakes that I make along the way. That is inevitable, but I appreciate it. And I uh, appreciate anyone who comments and, and just, again, follows along. For me, this is actually a really interesting uh, video series because I have taken a bit of a hiatus on real playthrough series on the channel. Um, that's mostly due to life busyness, and, and, and I've just how to prioritize my time, and I've been so busy and stressed out with, with other things that it just didn't make sense to try to do one of these, and I'm sort of having like this horseshoe problem or horseshoe event where I'm stressed enough that I just need a break somehow, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play a game. Um, and the funny thing is that this game, as everywhere that you see a counter set up, these counters have sat in that hex on this table 
uh, with the map out for about six months. I intended to play this game half a year ago. I set it up, I was getting ready, and life just got crazy. So finally, six months later, I'm going to give this a go. And uh, what will be really good is I can get this one uh, completed. I can more uh, accurately talk about all the Dark series or what all games I consider in the Dark series together and, and rank them and do stuff like that. And it frees up the table for a few other games that I know folks are really interested in. I know there's a lot of interest in the Vietnam reprint, in the Pacific War reprint, in the NATO reprint, in the Third World War reprint. Um, tons and tons of games that I would really like to get to the table, but I owe it uh, to uh, this, that it's been up for six months, we, we might as well play it. So ten turns, maybe it'll go pretty quick, maybe, maybe it won't. Um, so, so there you go. Uh, we do have things set up. So there's, uh, oops, I did, I did get one counter accidentally moved, so I'll fix that. So there's a few things we'll take a quick look at in terms of the overall map. So over here, and there's going to be a little bit of glare, uh, you see there's a, a terrain map key. There's a few, uh, tracks over here. So you have an allied asset air asset box that contains what air assets are available to them. Not all of them are available on turn one. They also have replacement tracks, which uh, I believe these are in the right locations, but I will double check before we get underway. We have the action round track, and then we also have the uh, turn record track, track which uh, I also have a few things that are supposed to come in on certain turns later uh, on the turns of concern. There's a few other things on there about Panzer refit, and when Operation Dynamo can be declared. Um, so those are some of the special rules that are uh, involved there where the German player will basically pick a turn to halt operations, refit his panzers, and then continue on, where the Allies basically have the opportunity to designate one of the channel ports up here to do uh, Operation Dynamo. And, you know, will we pick Dunkirk? Well, probably, uh, but we'll see. There's a couple other charts up here that govern uh, the... Rules for when the Netherlands and Belgium, uh, respectively, surrender. So that's obviously something as the Germans will want to trigger. There's also a victory point track, which nobody has victory points. Uh, there's a uh, panzer refit and replacement track for the Germans. And then a few other boxes that just govern some of the re uh, reinforcements that are going to come in the game. And if you look at what's here, you notice there's not much, right? Like... There's a few airborne, there's a track for airborne units for the Germans. There's their available air power. There are uh, uh, OKH reserves that the Germans can bring in, and the Allies have reinforcements. And you can see there's like turn two is this row, turn three, turn four is up to here, and then turn five, and then not anymore until turn nine. And that's it. There's really not that much in the way of reinforcements in this game as opposed to say the dark sands where there was like half the map space was given to show all the reinforcements and all the crazy force pull changes of the dark valley this is really a titan game now there are a few counters that are that are used in other scenarios those counters are marked as such um but generally what you see on the map is is what is available um, and when you look at the actual number of counters, you would see that, yes, the Allies have a fair number of counters compared to the Germans. The Germans really don't have that many. Um, but their skill is what's going to make the difference in terms of how the game portrays the difference between uh, the Germans and the Allies during this very specific uh, time frame. So if you're familiar with the Dark series, one way that that is handled um, is with the chit pool draws and what chits are available on any given turn to reflect more strategic level things. Um, oh, and that's, this is not the cup that I meant to grab. Um, there are, there are some cups that are not in other, uh, not in other Dark Series games. So each side has a tank, I'm not sure what you would call it, breakdown cup, where um, on a certain cadence, you will pull a chit from those cup, and they will tell you when, you know, which unit's uh, armor is getting 
stuck in the mud or needs to be repaired or running into issues, which is one of those weird twists, one of the Chrome rules of this game versus the other games that all have their own special rules where the, both the Allies and the German tanks can have unexpected problems, which will provide its own twist on things. But here you can see the more standard action shit. So you can see some say move, some will say combat, um, as opposed to other games in the Dark series, uh, this is sort of the innovation of later games, you don't have too many special chits. They're really movement and combat, uh, which will keep things pretty straightforward during the duration uh, of the game. There's just a couple of instances where the special chits can come into play. That is very specifically, again, the Allies declaring Operation Dynamo, the Germans declaring a Panzer refit for Case Red. And that's about the extent of it. So it should be relatively straightforward. Um, now, the... Uh, Germans are going to have certain advantages when it comes to uh, the way the chits are set up. So you can see here, this is an allied chit. It says action combat, the back, action combat. That's pretty much uh, the, the way it goes. Um, but the Germans, and if you're familiar with the Dark series, this shouldn't surprise you, the Germans can do a move, but on the back of this chit, it says combat. Um, so one of the ways that you have the asymmetry... And this is, again, this is something that can, that occurs throughout the Dark series in different ways. Um, when the Allies get a chit, it is very likely going to be move or combat. It's going to be one of those two, but that's it. You, the Allies will have to do a move. They will have to do a combat. The Germans uh, are more likely to have a, a choice. They can do a movement or a combat, whichever they think will be most advantageous to them. So that kind of reflects their uh, better command and control and, and the basic operating offensive initiative that they have on a more tactical level some of the big differences that are going to occur here and that are these are going to be very important over the course of this game is uh let's see if i can find it on the chart because it may be the easiest way to, to talk about this difference um if it's not on the chart then i can reference the rule book too i guess i'm, guess I'm gonna have to Ah, okay. I, I have it on the player aid chart. Let's take a look. So, how to read the units. You can see nothing too crazy. You got your unit size, you got your unit designation, you have a combat strength, uh, which is for both attack and defense. So, this example armor division of the French has a combat strength of four. The uh, movement is the third number, which that's pretty common, right? Red indicates motorized movement. But the center number is not a defense factor, it is a tactical rating. So in this case, the tactical rating is a 3. Some of these other example allied units, 3, 3. The combat strength may be different, but their overall tactical rating is the same. And this is representing, um, maybe if you looked at another game, it might be like the effectiveness rating or... Uh, a tac you know, a tactical rating in other games where it, it is a assessment of their overall tactical training and skill. Um, so by comparison, I mean, you can almost pick up any allied unit on the map here. Uh, the Belgians have two or three. The Netherlands have, uh, in some cases, one or two. The French are going to have two, three. There's a few fours out there. Same with the British, threes or fours. Um, the Germans, the infantry tend to be three, generally speaking, but the armor, here's a great example of one, has a five. Um, other armors have four, uh, we focus that, so a number of fours, some threes, but generally the armor units have a four. So what is the net effect of that? Well, if your unit has a higher tactical rating uh, than your opponents in any given space or area, um, I believe it is that the higher tactical rating unit can ignore Zox. Now, this is going to be one of those weird things in this game that will be very difficult to remember, and it is very different from the other games in the series and many other war games where, I mean, a Zox is a Zox, you stop or you have to pay extra movement points or, or what have you. Here, there are going to be cases where those zones of control simply do not matter. That's going to be a big deal.
Um, let's see if I can find the... Uh, it's in here somewhere, gosh darn it. See, I'm, I'm trying to be careful because I don't want to lie to you guys. Um, okay, so here's here's where it matters. So any motorized unit with a yellow movement allowance may ignore enemy Zocks for movement and retreat if all the enemy units exerting a Zoc into the hex in question have a lower effective tactical rating. Um, tactical rating. Yellow movement allowance units that don't have a higher tactical rating than adjacent enemy units must abide by the same rules as the black uh, movement allowance units. So um, again, these are really, what we're really going to be talking about are the armor units of the Germans. There is one uh, motorized infantry of the British that can do it. There's some uh, armored cavalry up here, or mechanized cavalry and a couple other British units, part of the BEF, that have that Zoc ignoring power. Um, technically, some of the French units here in the backfield do as well, um, but the majority of the units that have this ability uh, appear to be the Germans. So that's going to be their uh, special ability. Now, what I'm interested to see is just how often that special ability will will be present or will matter. Um, and I think that's going to be a core part of this game, especially as the Germans is looking, where can I bypass Zox? Where can I bypass my enemy and keep moving and do what I need to do? And it does mean that, yes, the Germans are likely going to be pushing themselves beyond maybe their, their normal supply tracing that they would ordinarily maybe keep to, they're going to have to be brave. They're going to look for those weird places. And when they can find those places to slip through the allied lines, it's going to put those allied units out of supply, and they're going to have a bunch of problems. And that's kind of how you're going to get the historical um, uh, historical outcome of some of this offensive. Now, there, like I said, there, there are certain historical rules that are going to come into play. Like a lot of these allied units are going to move into and get on to this line here. Um, the one thing I kind of, I, I'll say I dislike, there there are borders on the map that designate these different areas um, where like the French can't go into here or they can only go into here with certain units. The Allies must move up to a certain line around here. It's just that the lines that they use to demark these things are, they're different. If you look closely, you can tell the difference, but I wish they were somehow a little more distinct. Um, but for sure, we're going to have allies moving up to here. We're going to have a lack of proper allied defense through the Ardennes. The Germans are going to, you know, take the Netherlands out very likely, press into Belgium a little bit, but the greatest strength is going to come bursting through here. And as because the allies have to move forward, there's going to be that sickle cut. Uh, where they can come up through here, maybe try to cut off the guys trying to get out via Dunkirk, uh, and then have a pathway down here to Paris, which is a little bit off screen. So that's the basic overall narrative that I expect we're going to see happen, um, but we'll, we'll see. Um, now, with the scenario that we're playing, there's a valid question of like, well, how, how do we know for sure... Uh, who's going to win, or what, what are the real victory conditions? Um, the German player wins this scenario by having more than twice the number of allied victory points at the conclusion of the victory determination phase of turn 10. Uh, refer to the back of scenario for setup and charts card for the victory points. Well, we happen to have that. Um, let's see... Here we go. Victory points, scenario one and two victory points, both for the Allied and German. 
they do reiterate the victory uh, scenario. So um, again, if we're looking at this one, the Germans need to have twice the number of allied victory points. So what are we going to be trying to do as the allies to get victory points? Um, two victory points for each German use of terror bombing. So if Germans use terror bombing, there are certain tactical advantages, but that will give up victory points to the allies. Uh, one victory point if the Netherlands has not surrendered by the end of turn three. So if we can keep the Netherlands alive, the allied player will get a little bit of bonus for that. One victory point for each British or French step evacuated uh, out of, we'll say, Dunkirk for now. That's probably where Operation Dynamo will occur. And that's one VP for each step. So if a, a unit has two steps, that's two victory points. If you get a whole big stack of units out of there, that's going to be a lot of victory points. So this is probably how the Allies will get the majority of their victory points. Uh, three victory points per turn. Uh, at the turn end phase, if the Allied player can trace a line of communication between any one of Boulogne, Calais, or Dunkirk in the west or south edge of the map. So if we can keep that sickle cut, from completing. We'll get three victor, victory points per turn. That's nice. Three uh, VP when a French division occupies Breda and can trace a line of supply. I'm going to have to look on the map as to where Breda is. Breda. I'm sure I'm pronouncing it incorrectly. I'll have to look at that and make sure I understand what the uh, overall strategic Consideration is for that. Um, one victory point per turn. The German player does not keep a minimum garrison in the Netherlands, so it does mean that unless the Germans want to give up a victory point, they're going to have to keep some stuff in the Netherlands. One victory point per turn. The German player does not keep. Okay, same thing for Belgium. Um, and they are going to need to keep a minimum attack force adjacent to the Maginot Line, so they can't just pull stuff away from the Maginot Line. They're going to have to dedicate some of their forces to just maintaining that line. Um, there's some additional variable victory points. Uh, so if they can eliminate uh, some Panzer divisions, they can potentially get uh, some victory points that may vary. But basically, if they can beat up Panzers, that's good. Because the long term of the war, you know, if the Allies are taking Panzer divisions out of commission, that's going to delay the overall German timetable of war, even after France falls. Uh, and then uh, they can also get some victory points if they actually push into Germany. I'm not sure how likely that will be. Uh, and then five victory points if the Allied player holds any hex of Paris with a line of communication to the west or south parts of the map. So, I mean, generally, if, if we think about the big scheme strategy, right, for this game, I mean, we can, we can think about the, the real history and what they were trying to achieve and generally, all of these things incentivize the best play that is probably conceivable here, right? You can maybe pick some stuff up for attacking the Germans, however unlikely that is. If the uh, there's certain things that punish the German for trying to do gamey stuff, which is good, to just that's a that's there to keep them from doing that. Uh, but generally, if we can keep the channel ports uh, from being sickle cut, cutted. Uh, if we can retain control of Paris somehow, if we are delaying the Germans, if we can beat up their armor units, that can make the Pyrrhic vic you know, make it a Pyrrhic victory for the Germans um, instead of just, you know, a big, big, you know, crapshoot for the Allies. They, they can punish the Germans enough that uh, the Allies will win the scenario, right? Not win the war today, but win the scenario. Because, um, again, you look at these games in terms of, like, what happens if the Germans really foul this up? I mean, they could take France, but they're going to be in a really sorry shape trying to prepare for Barbarossa, or they may not be able to take, you know, Yugoslavia. I mean, there's all kinds of things that can play into, you know, what if the Allies had done some level of effort better uh, in this this campaign than, than they did. I mean, ultimately, the Allies won the war, but, you know, again, what are you what are you going for? The Germans, by comparison, also have a very long list of things. Um, if they can get Netherland the Netherlands to surrender on turn one, they get five victory points. They get a little bit less if it's on turn two. They will get none if the Netherlands surrenders on turn three or later. Uh, the Belgians, if they surrender on turn one or two, that's five victory points. 
Um, if they don't surrender until turns three to five, then there's going to be a variable lower number of victory points to the point that, you know, if it's after turn five, you don't get any victory points. Um, the allied player can declare Operation Dynamo early, sort of on demand on a particular turn. But if they do that, they're giving three victory points to the Germans. So there you go. Um, if the Germans can capture the Dynamo evacuation port, they're going to get two victory points. If they can take uh, Abbeville, uh, Amiens, Rev, Rez, I'm going to never pronounce that town city correctly. Um, if the Allies recapture it, then they won't get those victory points. If they can capture all Paris hexes in the early half of the game, they'll get vic uh, three victory points. If they can capture it before Paris is declared an open city, so that's something that can happen in the game. Uh, on turn 6 to 10, uh, they're going to get a whole bunch of victory points. So if the Germans can get into Paris quickly, they can get a whole bunch of extra victory points. Uh, they'll get some other, uh, they'll get fewer victory points. If they don't do that until later, um, there'll be variable, very vari uh, variable victory points for the Maginot line breached. Um, if you manage to do that, and then uh, once the Maginot fortified line is cut off from the west edge of the map, um, you're going to get a victory point for each end phase for that and a victory point for each yellow movement allowance motorized unit really exited off the west or south edge hexes. So that's just fulfilling case red and going to seize control of the rest of uh, France. So if we think about that in terms of what is the strategic direction for the Germans, obviously a pretty straightforward thing, right? We want to uh, knock the Netherlands and Belgium out as quickly as we can. We want to uh, get to Paris as quickly as we can. We'd like to take those uh, ports. Obviously, we're going to have to do what we can to deprive the Allied player from getting their victory points and, and evacuating a lot of these guys if we can. And then if we're breaking through the Maginot line, or at least able to create, uh, because it stipulates the western map edge, the Germans coming through here and basically getting across these rivers such that the rest of these units can't trace back you know, to the west. They can trace to the south, and that's okay. Um, but the Germans want them to not be able to trace to the west, and they'll get victory points each turn that they can do that. So, so you know, there's not that many sneaky things here or super special weird cases. Just, you know, the things you figure the Germans, the Allies, each probably would want to be doing. Yeah, you're going to get some victory points for that. I think it's still interesting that the Germans need to have twice as many victory points. Twice as many. Now, if you were... Um, uh, if you look at, like, the the victory in Scenario 3, where the sides are more evenly uh, allocated, then the victory really comes down to, can the Germans... Sorry? Can the Germans, you know, do these things, right? And if you were looking at... Scenario two, the German player wins if they get at least 20 more victory points than the Allied player. So it's just very interesting that just, again, given the historical constraints, the Germans have to have twice as many victory points. And I think what I've read online is that that might be hard to do. Like, you know, it, that's the funny thing. Like, if the folks maybe have criticized this game, but, oh, the Germans are going to, they're going to win. They're going to win Case Yellow. What's the point in playing? But the funny thing is, even if the Germans are winning... If they don't meet their victory conditions, then the Allied player can win. They, they can win. The onus or the balancing of the victory, you know, the onus is on the Germans to, to try to win well. If they don't win well, they lose the game. Uh, so at least there's that to it. It's not, this isn't a necessarily a pushover game. Um, if the Allies can can lose valiantly in the war, they win the game. So there, there's something we'll have to keep in mind. Um there's a couple of free setup hexes where the British can kind of set up in a handful of places. I didn't know what were the best picks for that, so they're just kind of out there, um, and, and that'll be good. Uh, we'll worry about all the special, like, turn one stuff that we need to keep in mind and all the special scenario-specific rules for the next video. I really just want this to be the introduction, talk about the game a little bit, 
kind of show what we're looking at, some basic things we'll need to keep in mind. Uh, the game has a lot of charts, a lot of different things. Um, it's sort of ahead of some of the other series games in that most of the weird special rule stuff is on all the player aid sheets, so we should have everything we need uh, to get right into the game as we go. The only thing that may be slow going for me off camera as I you know, learn the specific oddball things uh, in the game. The, probably one other thing I'll mention is that there are what I would consider like HQ units. So here's one is the French. I'm trying to think where the other ones are. Uh, the Germans have one here, and I think there's one right here. They're sort of these like attack supply units that you have to trace to them to be able to attack properly, I think it is. So it's almost like an HQ unit, but not quite. Again, kind of predates the, you know, the implementation of HQ units that you would see in the Dark Summer. Uh, or not, not the Dark Summer, I'm sorry. The Dark Valley or the Dark Sands. But they, they function similar to that. We'll get into more detail once the, the dice start going and the chits start getting pulled. Um, but okay, guys, I, I think that's everything I want to cover here. The start of a new series. I hope you liked this video. I hope it was any formative for you and get you ready for uh, more to come. Uh, let me know what you think down in the comment section below and I will try to get uh, the you know beginning episodes up just as soon as I can get the time uh, to get playing. I do uh, intend to try to hit that here in the near term. So thanks for watching guys. Really appreciate it. Uh, see you in the next one. Take care. Keep gaming.